Well, I only restored vintage English motorcycles, uh, Triumphs, Nortons, and BSAs, and um, we're, I do have an aerial that's, uh, that's in the works. It was a TT special, they called them, and uh, it was a special Bonneville. Bonnevilles were the, the fast ones, but the TTs were special, they were racing machines, and you could get them at that time. So I started saving my money, and eventually I got one. You have to have the vision. You have to. You have to be able to appreciate what the potential that a particular piece has and understand some of the, uh, the difficulty of, uh, of the transformation to get it from where it is now to where you want it to be. The way I live will inevitably be a reflection of the way that I think. True change always begins in our minds. And the good news is that God can always change the way that we think. In fact, he wants to transform you into a new person precisely that way. The Apostle Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What makes people the way they are, what makes you, you, is mostly the way you think. So becoming the best version of you rests in a sense on one simple directive, think great thoughts. People who live great lives are people who habitually think great thoughts. Their thoughts incline them towards confidence or love or generosity or joy. Trying to change your feelings by willpower without allowing the stream of your thoughts to be changed by the flow of the spirit is kind of like fumigating a house of a skunk smell while the skunks keep living in the crawl space. I've tried that, by the way, it doesn't work. But God can actually change the way we think. Our thought patterns become as habitual as brushing our teeth. After a while, I don't even notice them. I get so used to bitter thoughts or anxious thoughts or selfish thoughts, I don't even realize I'm having them. One of the great barriers to a flourishing mind is sometimes called mindlessness. Like, my body's at the breakfast table with my family, but my mind is not there. My mind is ruminating over my problems, a kind of repetitive, anxious, dull, low-grade obsession with tasks and challenges. I am absent-minded. That's an interesting word. My mind has gone AWOL. Other people can tell I'm not fully present because my face is less alive and responsive. I talk less, and when I do say something, it's kind of terse. Uh, I don't set out to do this. It simply becomes a habit of my mind. This is why the psalmist prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God actually knows my thoughts better than I do. And God will help me learn what's going on in my own mind from one moment to the next. So in a sense, the spiritual life kind of begins with paying attention to our thoughts, monitoring our minds. As I do this, I find some thoughts that are unwelcome visitors. I get anxious, I catastrophize, I envy. But I also begin to recognize what kinds of thoughts the Spirit flows in. The Apostle Paul gives us a wonderful kind of framework for understanding which are the thoughts and the attitudes that come from the Spirit? Paul says, the mind controlled by the sinful nature is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. So it works like this. Take any thought, 
take thoughts that feel weightier, that I find myself turning over and over in my mind, and ask this question. What direction do those thoughts lead me toward? Do they lead me toward life, toward being God's best version of myself, or away from that? And when I find thoughts that lead me towards God and His life, that's grace. Sometimes if I've messed up, those thoughts may have elements of pain in them, but they never paralyze me. They bring energy, they're true, and they give me ground to stand on. Over time, I realize if I can keep my mind centered on these kind of spirit thoughts, then right feelings and right actions are likely to flow out of my life. The prophet Isaiah said that God will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is stayed centered, rooted on God. And this is what it means to live in the flow of the Spirit in our minds. Very important to understand, you cannot stop thinking wrong thoughts by trying harder to not think them. But you can do something else. You can learn to set your mind. This is the most basic of human powers that God has given us. You have the power to place your mind to choose what you will pay attention to at any moment, including like this one right here while I'm talking. You can direct your thoughts in one direction or another. It is within our capacity to set our minds. And this explains why two different people can be in the same set of circumstances and yet have completely different experiences. Setting your mind is a little like setting a thermostat. It's creating a target for the climate. When you set a thermostat, the heater and the air conditioning have to click in to adjust in relation to the weather. It's a constant process. The goal is a system that's life-giving. And that's the way that it is with our mind. Our circumstances will always change. But many people who are troubled by negative thoughts try to tell themselves to stop thinking negative thoughts, which immediately brings to mind the very thoughts that we're supposed to stop thinking. There's another way. Paul says, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Or Paul says, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. This is the better way to set my mind on the goodness and availability of God. Now God's gift to you of your mind is unbelievably lavish. Let's talk about it for a minute. Before you were born, your body had produced about 200 billion neurons. You had such an embarrassment of riches that by the time you were born, you had already killed off about 100 billion of these neurons and you've never even missed them. And then they make connections with each other that give you the power to think and react. Between your second month in the womb and your second birthday, your body was producing 1.8 million synapses per second, and you were not even tired. The thoughts that you think have enormous power over your life. You know, even as recently as 20 years ago, researchers thought the adult brain was genetically determined and structurally unchangeable. But they have found now that well into adulthood, the brain is amazingly changeable. It has what's called neuroplasticity. What synapses remain and which ones wither away depends on your mental habits. Those that carry no traffic go out of business like bus routes with no customers. Those that get heavily trafficked by your thoughts get stronger and thicker. The mind shapes the brain. Neurons that fire together actually wire together. In other words, when you practice hope or practice love or practice joy, your mind is actually, literally, rewiring your brain. Now, precisely because we're made in the image of God, we have the capacity for what could be called directed mental force, the ability to direct our attention. But there is a fundamental battle in the spiritual life being waged by the evil one over the nature of the thoughts that run through your mind. The ultimate freedom you have, the freedom that nobody can take away from you, even in a prison or a concentration camp, is the freedom to decide what your mind will dwell on. So the idea is, I set my mind to look for the presence and goodness of God always in my life. 
And this is what allows me to tap into this river of living water that Jesus talked about that can flow out of the core of my being. Sometimes my emotion might be leading me down a destructive path. But the Spirit always offers another way. I'll give you an example. Somebody might say, you know, I'm in love with this guy. He's married. I know it's wrong. I can't help it. Well, actually, you can. Because we're never just victims of our thoughts. You can pray and ask the Spirit to help reset your heart. You could, if you wanted to, spend an hour a day, every day for a month, with women who have lost their husband to infidelity, listen to their stories, look into the eyes of their children, hear their betrayal, see a broken promise through their eyes, and you will find yourself thinking new thoughts. You really will. And in the flow of the Holy Spirit, your feelings will change. See, in any moment, I can turn my mind towards God. The Holy Spirit is always flowing, always wanting to renew our minds all the time. I can ask the Spirit to guide my thoughts. I can do that right now. I can pause. I can listen. I can feed my mind with excellence.